The Lorax. Love it or lose it. I'm reading the story to you today because I love it, and I'd like you to as well. The foreword to this story is by Pete Seeger. It says, Love it or lose it. Dear kids, beware. This book may change your life. Picture yourself playing in a city park or in your backyard if you're lucky enough to have one. What do you see? A tree to climb, birds in a nest, flowers. Now imagine all that taken away. There's a parking lot and a factory with smokestacks. Try planting flowers in the cement or breathing fresh air under the smokestacks. The world will be like this unless we can teach the kids of the world to love it before we lose it. How can we do that? Dr. Seuss found a way. He gets us laughing, gets us interested in the story of a very greedy onceler who cared only about money. But the onceler's happiness and success were short-lived. Even he came to realize that we really don't need the needs. Dr. Seuss asks us to speak up for the trees, the water, and the air. If something is wrong, if something wrong is being done to the environment, speak up as the Lorax did. Talk to your parents, your teachers, your legislators. Talk to anyone who will listen. Just by looking outside, we can see that the world is still a beautiful place. But as Dr. Seuss would put it, it won't be. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. The most important thing you kids can do is to ask the right questions, the kind that make people think about why we are destroying the world. And maybe we'll all learn to laugh as we speak up for the Lorax and, and one-up the Onceslers in our neighborhood. For, you, for it's you kids who will get us to clean up the mess. What mess? Turn the page and start. I think that's what I'll do. So again, the Lorax by Dr. Seuss. At the far end of town where the grickle grass grows and the wind smells slow and sour when it blows and no birds ever sing excepting old crows is the street of the lifted Lorax. And deep in the gr grickle grass, some people say, if you look deep enough, you can still see today where the Lorax once stood just as long as it could before someone lifted the Lorax away. What was the Lorax and why was it there? And why was it lifted and taken somewhere from the far end of town where the grickle grass grows? The old onceler still lives there, lives here. Ask him. He knows. You won't see the onceler. Don't knock at his door. He stays in his lurkdom at the top of his store. He lurks in his lurkdom cold under the roof where he makes his own clothes out of myth muffered moof. And on special dank midnights in August, he peeks out of the shutters and sometimes he speaks and tells how the Lorax was lifted away. He'll tell you, perhaps, if you're willing to pay. On the end of a rope, he lets down a tin pail, and you have to toss in 15 cents and a nail, and the shell of a great, great, great grandfather's snail. Then he pulls up the pail. He makes a most careful count to see if you'd paid him the proper amount. Then he hides what you paid him away in his snubby. And, excuse me, away in his snub, his secret strange hole in his groovelous glove. Then he grunts, I will call you by whisper my phone, for the secrets I tell you are for your ears alone. <sharp> Down slops the whisper my phone to your ear, and the old onceler's whispers are not very clear, since they have to come down through a snurgly hose, and he sounds as if he had smallish bees up his nose. Now I'll tell you, he says, with his teeth sounding gray, how the Lorax got lifted and taken away. It all started way back, such a long, long time back. Way back in the days when the grass was still green, and the pond was still wet, and the clouds were still clean. And the song of the swoomy swans rang out in space. One morning I came to this glorious place. And first I saw the trees, the truffle trees, the bright colored tufts, Truffs, tufts of the truffle trees, mile after mile in the fresh morning breeze, and under the trees I saw barn, brown barbalutes frisking about in their barbalute suits as they played in the shade and ate truffle fruits. From the rippleless pond came the comfortable sound of the humming fish humming, hmm, well splashing around. But those trees, those trees, those truffle trees, all my life I've been searching for trees such as these. The touch of their truffs was much softer, softer than silk, and they had the sweet smell of fresh butterfly milk. I felt a great leaping in my in joy in my heart. I knew just what I'd do. I unloaded my cart. In no time at all, I had built a small shop. Then I chopped down a truffle tree with one chop. 
And with great skillful skill and great speedy speed, I took the soft tuft and I knitted a thneed. I didn't stutter. A thneed. The instant I'd finished, I heard a gazump. I looked. I saw something pop out of the stump of the tree I chopped down. It was sort of a man. Describe him. That's hard. I'm not sure if I can. He was shortish and oldish and brownish and mossy, and he spoke with a voice that was sharpish and bossy. Mister, he said with a sawdusty sneeze. I am the Lorax. I speak for the trees. I speak for the trees, for the trees have no tongues, and I'm asking you, sir, at the top of my lungs. He was very upset, and he shouted and puffed. <gasps> What's that thing you've made out of my truffle tuft? <clears throat> Look, Lorax, I said, there's no cause for alarm. I chopped just one tree. I'm doing no harm. I'm being quite useful. This thing is a need. A need to find something that all people need. It's a shirt. It's a sock. It's a glove. It's a hat. But it has other uses. Yes, far beyond that. You can use it for carpets, for pillows, for sheets, or curtains, or covers, for bicycle seats. <clears throat> the, the Lorax said, Sir, you are crazy with greed. There is no one on earth who would buy that fool's need. But the very minute I proved he was wrong, for just that minute a chap came along, and he thought that the need I had knitted was great. He happily bought it for three ninety-eight. I laughed at the Lorax. You poor stupid guy, you can never tell what some people will buy. I repeat, cried the Lorax, I speak for the trees. I'm busy, I told him. Shut up if you please. I rushed across the room and in no time at all built a radio phone. I put in a quick call. I called my brothers and uncles and aunts and I said, listen here. Here's a wonderful chance for the whole Winsler family to get mighty rich. Get over here fast, take the road to North Niche. Turn left at Weehawken, sharp right at South Stitch. And in no time at all, in the factory I built, the whole Winsler family was working full tilt. We were knitting needs as busy as bees to the sound of chopping of truffle trees. Then, oh baby, oh, how my business did grow. Not chopping one tree at a time was too slow. So I quickly invented my super axe hacker with which whacked off four truffle the trees at one smacker. We were macking needs four times as fast as before. And that Lorax, he didn't show up anymore. But the next week he knocked on my new office door. He snapped. I'm the Lorax who speaks for the trees, which you seem to be chopping as fast as you please. But I'm also in charge of the brown barbaloots who played in the shade in their barbaloot suits and happily lived eating truffle of fruits. Now, thanks to your hacking my tree to the ground, there's not enough truffle of fruit to go round. And my poor barbaloots are all getting the crummies because they have gas and no food in their tummies. Hm. They love living here, but I can't let them stay. They'll have to find food, and I hope that they may. Good luck, boys, he cried, and he sent them away. I, the one slur, felt sad as I watched them all go. But business is business, and business must grow, regardless of crummies and tummies, you know. I meant no harm. I most truly did not, but I had to grow bigger, so bigger I got. I biggered my factory, I biggered my roads, I biggered my wagons, I biggered the loads of the needs I shipped out. I was shipping them forth to the south, to the east, to the west, to the north. I went right on biggering, selling more needs. I biggered my money, which everyone needs. Then again he came back. I was fixing some pipes when that old nuisance Lorax came back with more gripes. I am the Lorax, he coughed and he whiffed. He sneezed and he snuffled, he snargled. He sniffed. Wunsler, he cried with a cruffless croak. Wunsler, you're making such smogless smoke. My poor swami swans, why they can't sing a note. No one can sing who is smog in his throat. And so, said the Lorax, <laughs> please pardon my cough. They cannot live here, so I'm sending them off. Where will they go? I don't hopefully know. They may have to fly for a month or a year to escape from the smog you've smogged up around here. What's more, snapped the smart Lorax, his dander was up. Let me say a few words about gluppity gluck. Your machinery chugs on day and night without stop, making gluppity glup also schloppity schlop. What do you do with this leftover goo? I'll show you, you dirty old onceler man, you. You're glumping the pond with a humming fish hummed. No more can they hum for their gills are all gummed. So I'm sending them off, oh, their future is dreary. They'll walk on their fins and they'll get woefully weary in search of some water that isn't so smeary. 
And then I got mad. I got terribly mad. I yelled at the Lorax. Now listen up. Now listen here, Dad. All you do is yap, yap, and say, bad, 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 bad. Well, I have my rights, sir, and I'm telling you, I intend to go on doing just what I do. And for your information, you Lorax, I'm figuring, I'm figuring, I'm figuring, I'm figuring, turning more truffle trees into thneeds, which everyone, everyone needs. And at that very moment, we heard a loud whack. From outside in the fields came a sickening smack of an axe on a tree, then we heard the tree fall, the very last truffle a tree of them all. No more trees, no more needs, no more work to be done. So in no time, my uncles and aunts, every one, all waved me goodbye, they jumped into my cars and drove away under the smoke-smuggered stars. Now all that was left neath the bad-smelling sky was my big empty factory, the Lorax, and I. The Lorax said nothing, he just gave me a glance. He gave me a very sad, sad backwards glance. He lifted himself by the seat of his pants, and I'll never forget the grim look on his face when he heisted himself and took leave of this place through the hole in the smog without leaving a trace. And all that the Lorax left here in this mess was a small pile of rocks with one word, unless. Whatever that meant, well, I just couldn't guess. But that was long, long ago. But. But each day since that day, I've sat here and worried and worried away. Through the years when my buildings have fallen apart, i worried about it with all of my heart. But now, said the Wensler, now that you're here, the word of the Lorax seems perfectly clear. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. So, catch calls the Wunsler. He lets something fall. It's a truffleless seed. It's the last one of all. You're in charge of the last truffleless seeds, and truffle trees are what everyone needs. Plant a new truffle, treat it with care, give it clean water, and feed it fresh air. Grow a forest protected from axes that hack. Then the Lorax and all of his friends may come back. Thanks for listening.